Amen. Amen. First Samuel chapter 30. Uh, title of my sermon this evening is Faith, Hope, and Charity. Faith, Hope, and Charity. Now I see these three displayed in this story, Faith, Hope, and Charity. All of them walking together. And God wants us to have all these in varying degrees, obviously. So faith, obviously you need faith to be saved. And how much faith do you need to be saved? A tiny amount. I mean, if God, Jesus said if you had a faith as little as a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain, get from here and cast yourself uh, into the sea, and it will do so. So you need just a tiny little faith to be saved. And so God expects us to have faith, because that is a commandment of God, to obey the gospel, and that is to believe on Jesus Christ. So faith, and also we need faith to live our lives. You just shall live by faith. Then hope. You know, we are saved by hope. When you're saved, you know, you know, you're hoping for that change. You know, in Romans chapter 8, verse 24, it talks about, you know, us being saved by hope. So, hope helps us with patience, and patience perfects us. So, we get perfection through impatience, and it's teaching us to wait upon the Lord, right? So, God wants us to wait upon Him, to wait on His timing, the timings and the seasons of the Lord. So, we need to have hope. So, God wants us to have hope. Then, charity. Charity is a display of love, of love indeed, and the love of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and anyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. And he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So, that's the kind of love God wants us to have. And you can see that in 1 Corinthians 13, if you read the, uh, the chapter of love. So, let's get into the story, because I see these three displayed, faith, hope, charity. Uh, verse 1, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So the Amalekites have not changed. Remember how the Amalekites were introduced to the Israelites coming out of Egypt? They attacked that, the horde of the Israelites coming out. Why? Because they want to take advantage of people, right? They want to take advantage of the slaves. You know, these people had no standing army or anything. Oh, let's just attack them, take their stuff. We heard that they came out of Egypt. All the wonders of Egypt, they are the first ones to go out and attack and just on the way. And that's why there's a curse upon them. You wonder why is there a curse upon them? Because that is their lifestyle. You can see men went out to battle, right? And what the Amalekites do? Oh yeah, all these villages have left, are left open. So let's just go there, only the women and the children, the little ones. Let's just go there and take advantage of them. That is who the Amalekites are. They have no honor. So, uh, and that's why God is punishing them. And that's why the curse of God is upon them. So, fortunately, they had no reason to shed blood. Fortunately for David and his men, they had no reason to shed blood because there were no men there. Because they were not expecting a battle. These people are without honor. Uh, and David's village appears to be targeted. It looks like you read the story and you see that his village was smitten. Right? So when it says smitten, it was like broken down, destroyed, burned with fire, as opposed to all the other villages around. Uh, in fact, look at what in verse 14, verse 14, uh, the servants, look at what he said about the invasion of his masters. It says, We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, and upon the coast which belonged to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned the Ziglag with fire. How come it's only Ziglag that's burned with fire, <laughs> right? I believe it's because that's where David is. God allowed this to happen, just like in the case of Job, right? So uh, Job, a fire came down from heaven, obviously by the devil, uh, to destroy the, the uh, things of Job, the house, his, his houses, his kids, his, all his, uh, animal, his beasts, his cattle, all of that. So his stuff was destroyed and taken away. And that was the work of the devil, and that was a test for Job, too. And obviously, Job passed that test. Uh, it was a very stressful one for Job. But it's a lesson for us. And if that is happening in your life, as David saw that it was happening in his life, uh, it's a lesson for him to learn, which he learns real quick. The Lord giver, the Lord taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. All these things can come and go. Earthly things can be replaced. Right? So first of all, thank God for your salvation and thank God that you know, you're still alive and that you can still make some changes. Don't just give up all hope because you lost property or you lost family. I, I, I know it's sad, but obviously you can see that God did that with Job, can take his children 
I mean, that's one of the worst things is, I would rather die, right? That's how Job was feeling. Yeah, and, and any man or any parent that loses their child, they would rather give their lives for, their, for the child, especially if it's a good child, <laughs> right? So they would rather die, but understand that God can bless you again, especially if it's just material things. Let's keep reading, verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Open to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. So all that David had acquired, why did he go to Moab? Remember, that was, I don't believe that was God's plan because God told him and never told him anything different to stay in the land of Judah. But he went to Moab because he just figured, uh, you know, Saul is not going to stop chasing me. So I'm just going to go and stay where I'm comfortable. He went to land, uh, uh, that's Moab, sorry. He went to land of Gath. First of all, he went to Moab. Then after he went to land of Gath, that is the Philistines land. And he decided to find a country place, which is Ziglag, and he stayed there. So that was not God's plan. And he acquired a lot. Remember, he went, he raided the Amalekite lands and, and the lands around there. And he took all their stuff, killing everybody. Buddy. So all that is coming back to hunt him, uh, uh, literally speaking. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this verse, in what the idea I'm trying to teach, you, uh, uh, teach here is, why are you still alive? Why is it, okay, why are, you, why are we not just dead and gone to heaven and, you know, living and reigning with Christ? Because God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards God, not willing that any should perish. God wants to save people. The long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, as the Bible says. Right. God wants to save people. That's why you're still here. You're not here to just go to Gath and be, with, be in the world, get a place for yourself, a nice place, a monastery, some nice land, so you just, you just live a good life. Life. That's not why God made you. That's not why you're still alive. That's why David's like, oh, I'm no more going to suffer. I don't want to keep going around where uh, Saul is chasing me. I'm just going to go somewhere else outside the will of God so that I can just re live my life peacefully. You know, get my two wives, my men, and we're, we're fine. I'll just serve my master, right? And I'll live a good life. But that's not why you're made. That's not why God is preserving you and keeping you. It is for his own uh, uh, pleasure. It's for his own benefit, for the propagation of the kingdom, the gospel, and building the kingdom of God. So be ready to suffer. Why? Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Everything will be burnt up. Everything will melt. Everything you think, oh, I'm just going to live my life and have my family and have my this and have my that. If it is not the will of God, everything is gone. It's burnt up. They're all earthly things. You should be living for eternal things. That's what you should be living for. Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? So you know all these things are going to be destroyed. How should you be living your life? Go find a ministry, go find a rural area, just forget about the work of God so that you can live in peace and no persecution, no tribulation. Just remove internet, everything, just live in the woods. Everything will be burnt up. All the things you built, all the things that you think you have, your children, your wife, your family, all that can be lost in the blink of an eye. Nevertheless, verse 13, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So that is how we should live our lives here. And don't be like David running to the king of Gath and getting your own countryside to live in Ziglag. Because at the end, what happened? Ziglag was burned, burned down. So David, all that David acquired gone, his family taken captive. At first glance, they're as good as dead. You know, as, they, as he came, or oh, no family, his wife, his children, all of, his wife, his children, all of them taken. They're as good as dead. But guess what? It's even worse. Because he didn't see dead bodies. <laughs> right? When David's baby died, he's like, oh, the baby's dead. You know, it's going to go to heaven. You know, it is what it is. Right? But what if that baby was captured? <laughs> it might be raised by another man, might never be saved, and now go to hell after suffering all his life. 
So you just think. <laughs> it's actually better. Like, oh, yeah, you just saw their dead bodies. But no, they're going to be suffering, be abused. They are slaves, basically. Have no lives. His children, his wives. That's what they're thinking because they don't see dead bodies. So it's even worse. So you, you think you have everything, but if you're outside the will of God, there are worse things than death, right? And that's why they just stayed there and they were weeping and weeping. So all their possessions gone too. And uh, because if they were in Judah running from Saul, they will probably not have gathered as much possessions. And therefore, the Amalekites will not want to go attack them in the caves. Because <laughs> what do they have? The Amalekites are going, they're advantageous people. They just want to go and take, uh, take advantage of people. So they don't have had much. You know, you're passing through, you're a pilgrim. Don't think of acquiring and acquiring. Where your wealth is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, the Bible says. So living outside the will of God will cost you everything. You think you're gathering it up, but you know, pride comes before it fall. So as the higher you go and much you get, next thing there's a crash, all your investments, your bitcoins. All gone. <laughs> oh, but you're acquiring, acquiring, saving, put everything. But is that the lifestyle that God wants? So it's only by the message of God that they can be recovered, right? And as I said, who knows how abused these captives were? Because yes, they were in captivity for a few days, and you know what can happen in those few days being pushed along and carried along, all these men. And yeah, you say, oh, that was not in the story. It might not have been in the story, but don't be naive. You know, God gave the children of Israel laws concerning wars. You know, when you capture people, how to treat them. Don't just abuse the women and abuse them. You know, you have to get married to them. You know, don't just cast them aside, if not set them free. Why was God giving all those laws? Because the people in those lands, they do the same things. They do that. They abuse their captives and all of that. So who knows how much Daniel, right? God doesn't say that he was a eunuch, but I mean, when you read the, the, the Bible, the text, you'll be like, yeah, he probably was a eunuch, <laughs> right? But it's sad. God expects us to understand these things without just like see these things in the text, without b basically writing everything out. So it was the curse of God for the sins of Israel that they would capture your sons and they will make them eunuchs. So, where did that happen? You can see that example in Daniel. And many other examples. So when they were, were taking captives, God doesn't have to say, oh, he made all these ones eunuchs. Yeah. That's what those people did at the time. Another example is the life of Esther. Yes, it doesn't show the bad side of being the life of Esther, but it actually says it there in the text. It doesn't write it out plainly, but it's if you read in between the lines. Who, I don't want my daughter to have a husband that only sees her once a month. <laughs> and that each enters his presence, and he doesn't raise his scepter, she's dead. Like, who wants to be that wife? That, oh yeah, I'm gonna try all these women. Oh, I love you, you're the one that will take the queen, but I'm still not gonna see you. Oh, what, well, you think he's just celibate until he sees her? You know, that's, these, these are not the kinds of lives that God wants us to live, and that's how bad those people, that culture, how the, uh, the traditions of the world, basically, is. So, you might, God might not plainly say that, but you should read that and understand the evils that are going on. War is not a good thing. So, that's why these men were weeping for their family. Look at verse 4. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Open to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I tell my children this. Weeping does not change anything. I say crying, but you know. Weep, crying in the Bible it means shouting, lifting up your voice. Weeping is what we call crying these days. <laughs> anyway, weeping does not change anything. You can cry and cry and cry. If I correct you and I spank you and you're just crying and I don't see any change, what was I crying for? Right? Like, weeping doesn't change anything. Yes, it's an emotion. Get it out of your system, but don't cry like there's no tomorrow. You know, there's a reason for everything. Get emotion out of your system and make changes. Do something. Take action. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Remember, faith, hope, love, or charity. So those three. So don't sorrow like you have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, 
even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So you comfort one another, you comfort yourself. God is saying, what is the worst thing that can happen, right? Your loved one. Not just the loved one you've been trying to preach to and preach to and doesn't want to receive the gospel. Okay? You know? Who's my mother? Who's my brethren? Those that hear the word of God and do the word of God. That same is my mother, the same is my brother, right? So now your loved one in Christ that you love and that person dies. What is God saying? Don't weep like it, you know, there's no tomorrow. You should have hope, right? And act. Go back to doing what God tells you to do, <laughs> right? And act. Don't just weep and cry and lose all your power and everything. And that's what these men were doing. It's just like anger, you know, crying, the emotions. Anger too is an emotion. Don't be overcome by your emotion. You know, anger dwells in the bosom of fools or rests in the bosom of fools. Don't be, don't be overcome by emotions. Even joy, right? If you're going to have joy, make sure it's in the Lord, right? Because your joy, peace, all of that should be in the Holy Ghost. Uh, it should be in the Lord. It's because you understand what God is going to do. Your emotions should not just take over you. Right? You should always keep your emotions in check. Now, these men were strong. They were ready for war. They marched back and, you know, they had all this energy. They've been ready for war. And the weeping took all that strength away. All the strength they had. They couldn't fight anymore. They had no more power to cry. Not talk of lifting up weapons or anything to go and fight. And this is why God wants us rejoicing always. Because this is what sadness can do. This world is evil, it's full of sorrow, it's full of... In this world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. So don't be easily offended in this world. Because if not, you will not have the peace of God in you. But if you have the... If, uh, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Right? So don't be easily offended by any little thing that goes in, or even great things in this world. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. That's what I'm trying to say. Fear causes paralysis. Right? And sadness makes you weak, and that weakness increases your fear, increases your anger. I mean, you just get into that uh, slippery slope of human emotions, and you're just messed up. You start having depression, next thing you think of killing yourself, all because something evil happened. So control the flesh, put under the body. Look at verse 5. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So responsibility always falls on the leader, and rightfully so, right? So yes, uh, they were happy to move to the land of Ziggler, to go to Gath and they were happy they were like finally David is leaving Judah we're just running we're afraid for our lives we can't kill Saul we can't kill anybody we can't attack anybody we're in Judah we're just helpless people can tell on us and Saul will show up I mean it was just a life that they might die tomorrow they don't know what's gonna happen so but now we are in Gath we are safe we're raising our family they were all happy about that decision it looked like living peacefully so-called but when everything you know goes down the toilet and they've lost everything what happened oh now david you're at fault <laughs> right so david's not at fault so the leader is responsible to make that difficult decision of staying in judah that is staying in the will of god even if it means suffering right you have to make that decision that's why the bible says in season out of season it's not only when everything is good, you make the decision, then, oh, yeah, that means he's a great leader because making decision when everything is good. But when everything is it's hard, but that is the will of God, you have to stay in it, even if the people don't like it. So David was responsible. So, but David did not shy away from his responsibilities. So every man began thinking about himself. Oh, since they cannot do anything, let's just kill David. What else can we do? Let's just hold that guy that is responsible. So they thought about killing David. But as a leader, serving people is also helping yourself. And that's the good thing about being a leader. You're helping yourself as you're serving people. Um, 
who, the greater the kingdom of God is the servant of all. So that just tells you automatically. But David was not only trying to save his skin. If not, David would have just run away. Taken the first horse and just, oh wow, they're thinking of stoning me. Probably get some men around him, you know, and defend himself. But that's not what he was thinking of. Uh, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He was distressed, and, but he encouraged himself in the Lord. That is the exact opposite of fainting in the mind. Right? The Bible says don't faint in your mind. Right? It's not that oh, you, you, you don't have enough physical strength, but it's because you think that you gave up. You, you quit. So David, David did not quit. He had his responsibilities. And he encouraged himself in the Lord. What, is it, what does that mean? You're making yourself stronger. You're fortifying yourself. And how does that come? It's by the word of God. It's by knowing what God has said. Standing on the promises of God. So the Lord had brought him this far. He, if David was going to die, Saul could have killed him. I mean, you, you look back, if I was going to die, probably I would have died at a certain time or a certain time. You can point at times in your life, I can. But if I didn't die those times, then that means God has a purpose for me, right? And I'm going to fulfill that purpose. So God has brought him this far. The Lord anointed him king. And he's not sitting on the throne yet. He wasn't anointed king like, oh yeah, we are spiritual kings and all of that. No, no, no. He was a physical king. So he has to sit on the throne. Right? In Israel. So if that hasn't happened, then he's not dying yet. So why are you going to run away? How about you stand for your people? Right? So David, this is him encouraging himself in the Lord. God is merciful. So yes, I was outside his will. Yes, he allowed these things to happen. But I can call on God to save me. What should I do? Or to help me? How can I appease these people? That's what he's thinking. How can I appease these people? And he can think, oh yeah, but... It's been a while. It's been days. This did not just happen. Ziglag was burned down. Like, you come and the house had... Imagine a house burning down and no fire, fighter, nothing. The house just finished burning down and everything is done. So for days, remember they took days. They went with uh, David and his men. Went with Achish, the king of Gath. And after, he said, rest the next day, go back. They took days to come back. So by the time they came back, I mean... Who knows when this happened? This has probably happened days ago. The people that have taken their family could have gone for days too. Like, who knows where they are, who they are. So, but nothing is impossible for God. Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? It's us that are fainting in our minds. It's us that are giving up. No matter what situation, what problem you're, you're going through, encourage yourself in the Lord. Is this God's will? Is this what God wants? This is how far God has taken you? What, what do you think God wants for you? So there was a display of faith, there was a display of hope, and there was a display of charity because he's trying to help his people because he loved them. He wasn't just trying to run away. Oh, I'll probably get better men because this man, anyway, this man wanted me to kill Saul, <laughs> right? He could have said that. He could have made excuses, but no. He stood there and he encouraged himself. So his responsibility made him a better person. You know, I, I, I think that way of myself sometimes. I, I think I'm better under pressure. I'm just talking. Maybe I speak foolishly. <laughs> you know, I remember in college, every time I'm studying, I have an exam, I study the night before. Because I'm always busy. I go to work. I do different things. So the night before exam is tomorrow. Like, under pressure, I study and I just pass the exams. That's why I don't remember anything. <laughs> I just pass exams. <laughs> anyway, then, you know, even if I'm playing sports, you know, if I have my family watching, my wife comes and she watches, I win the game, score many goals. You know, that happens. <laughs> But seriously though, being a pastor, I have grown because I have to prepare sermons. I have to know what I'm preaching. I have to represent the Lord, right? And the church, I'm accountable to you, accountable to Jesus Christ. So that is some pressure, that is responsibility, and it has made me grow. Just as the responsibility made David grow. Okay, take care of the sheep, he fought lions and bears. He wouldn't have woken up that morning, wow, there are lions and bears eating up that person, uh, those people's sheep. He wouldn't have done anything. But because he had that responsibility, responsibility will make you a better person. Don't shy away from responsibility or run away from responsibility. We all have responsibilities, right? Parents have responsibilities. Children, you have responsibilities to be pleasing to your parents, to obey them. So don't think, oh, I'm a child. I have no responsibility. Everyone has a responsibility. So be better for that. And don't shy away from your responsibility. The major sin in David's life, Bathsheba, was when he refused to do his responsibility. The time kings went out to war. Okay, then he fell into sin. So don't shy away from responsibility. So he turned his distress into positivity. Under pressure, David turns to the Lord. Many Psalms David wrote, 
uh, in times of trouble, call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. Run to the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. You know, call upon me in the days of in the times of trouble. Open to Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, verse thirty-one. So you have really any problems you have, relationship problems, financial problems. You're falling into sin. No matter what it is. In, in yourself, with somebody else, remember to call upon the Lord. What problems do you find yourself in? What, dis what is distressing you? What does the Bible say? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. The Bible says, what shall, we, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I want us to understand verse 32. Don't just read it and just blow past it. God sent his only begotten son to die for us. Jesus Christ came as a human being and died for our sin. A shameful death. He despised the shame. If God can allow his son to die for us, I mean, he has already shown his cards. What else will he not do for us? What, what is greater than that? What, what can't he do? <laughs> I mean... What can't he do else for us? He's going to do everything for us. He's going to give us the word of God. He's going to try to help us. It is us that are fighting against ourselves. If we are defeated, it is us that defeat ourselves. Right. It's not like, oh, God messed up. He didn't hold us here. Or he allowed the devil. No, it's because of you. It's because of me. It's we that bring ourselves down. It's when we quit, that's when we lose. Okay. All right, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. <coughs> Excuse me. Who is he that condemneth? It? it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? You know, David is thinking. I mean, God loves me. He has set me up. Nothing can separate me from this love that God has for me. Even when I'm going through tribulation, I'm going through distress because people are trying to kill me, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So know who you are in Christ and act accordingly. Faith, hope, love, or charity. Look at verse 7. I need to go faster. And David said to Ab Abiath, sorry. And David said to Abiathar the priest, ah Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. It, sh it sure seems like a simple decision after all. So after all the crying and all that, and the weeping and all that, all you had to do was just ask the Lord and God, oh yeah, for sure, you overtake all, and you recover all. You overtake and recover all. So, but don't play down the hopelessness of the situation. Because there was a lot of hope for, and faith for David to pray this prayer. Their village was raided, as I said, days ago. And the enemy is unknown, maybe dwelling in a stronghold. So even if David brings the 600 men, what he needs, machines, you know, war machines or war engines to break down the stronghold. Like, who knows what happened? But uh, God was just waiting for David to call upon him. While David was weeping and all that was happening, God was quiet. He was waiting for David to call upon him. So folks, learn to pray. Learn to pray. And see, he prayed and God answered. This was not, oh, he prayed and, you know, a prophet had to come two days, two days after or one day after. It was like instantly. So we have the word of God right here. Read your Bible. Pray. When you pray and you read your Bible, God is telling you what to do. God is teaching you. The Holy Spirit will instruct you on what to do. There is no question that you have in this earth right now that the Bible does not have the answer to. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Right? Come to church. Let, understand the preaching of the word. You know, read the Bible over and over again and continue to understand the application of the word of God in our lives today. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. There's no question you can ask. You say, oh, the Bible doesn't have an, an answer to this life situation. God has the answer to it. And all the examples are there. 
So, and the Holy Spirit will instruct you and teach you, this is what you should do. All right. So God was waiting for David to call upon him, and God answered with all the information that David needed. David did not have to ask twice. Like in the time when he was going to help the, uh, the people of Kili, I think. He was like, okay, so should I do this? Uh, will I do No, God told him everything. Go pursue, you overtake, and you recover all. He didn't even ask if you recover all. He said, should I pursue, will I overtake? <laughs> no, you recover all. Because he probably was not even thinking he was going to recover all. At least if I get some of his kids back, that is the, pe the people's kids back, maybe I get one of my wives or something, at least it's, they will not stone me, and you know it helps the situation. But God said he'll recover all. So God is here for us waiting. Are you praying? Or oh, you have this distress, you have this situation. All you're thinking about is how you can solve it. Or you're letting your emotions get the best of you. Are you calling upon the Lord? God wants us to call upon him. Peter, God told Peter, come out of the boat. Yes, it's me. Come, come towards me. Peter was walking on the water. I started sinking. Jesus was looking. I told you to come towards me. Right? We're still sinking. Lord, save me. Okay, then I'll save you. So until you call, the, the thieves on the cross, one, one was saying, save me physically. The other one saying, save me spiritually. Who did God listen to? The one that was sincere and, you know, both, they were all going to die anyway. So that guy that was dying uh, on, on his left, I think, he said, you know, you'll be with me today, this day in paradise. Because he called upon him to save him. So unless you call upon the Lord, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. If I die, does the grave glorify you? I mean, David literally said that. So God wants us to glorify him. So cast all your cares upon him, for he cared for us. And, and he says, without fail, recover all. God gives us more than we expect, exceedingly, uh, abundantly, above more than we can ever ask or think. Just ask! Right? Just pray, you know, and he'll give you more. David, as I said, probably just thinking of getting a few members back or a few family members, but he got all of them back. So this is God encouraging David also. Because the Bible says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. So you encourage yourself in the Lord. You go and ask the Lord. God will encourage you too. So David is like, oh, wow. It's not just that I will catch up with them. Hey, I will even recover all. Guys, let's go. <laughs> Let's go. You've now given them a job to do, a focus that you're going to do it, and they went with his faith. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord, right? They went with him, and wow, they were ready to fight and get back their family, as opposed to stoning David. So, we are the ones that are delaying by weeping and crying and just staying there thinking of how big our problem is. It's not looking at how big our God is. So the earlier you run to God, the better. So where is your faith? That's the question. Verse 9. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bissau. So the brook Bissau, if you look at the map, was a long way off of Ziglag. It's not like, oh, they just, you know, walk down two miles and brook Bissau. Oh, I'm so tired, I can't go. It's a long way. It shows that they were running, looking. They don't even know where they're going. God just said, pursue, overtake. You know, you recover. They're just like, oh, let's start going heading south. Right? They were running. I'm not saying they were just doing it. I, I believe it's in faith. They were like, okay, God is going to lead us. They just started pursuing. Right? God's going to lead us, and he led them to somebody, obviously. But they got to that brook, Bisho, and um, some men were tired. Now, did God say, pursue with 600 men, and you will, then you recover all? No. He just told David. You will recover all, right? Without fail. So I was talking to David. So with, no matter what number David goes with, it's not with God, it's not about numbers. God can deliver with few or with many. And David knows that story. Even Jonathan probably has told him that story. Because Jonathan fought with his armor bearer, and Jonathan knew that knew the story too of Gideon. Anyway, so David, it's not about the numbers of how many people you have or what do you have. And it might not be the fault of his men. Some men, what if he had some warriors that are just like gigantic? They, this David was running, right? He had to catch up with a horde of, uh, of people that stole all his, or his things and his 
family. So they were probably like sprinting. They weren't just marching. All right, let's get going. No, they were probably sprinting and running. All oh, they're running. They stop, check, where are we going? We're running. You have to think of, how, think of it in your mind. That's why about 200 men, probably the big guys holding this stuff, they couldn't go anymore. So David said, okay, you guys stay there. And that did not deter his fate because no matter what number it is, diversity in, in the people are good. Because maybe those big guys were able to do other things that the lighter guys that can run or that have the strength, endurance, cannot do. So diversity is good in a group of people that you have. Not everybody can do everything. Some people cannot go so winning all day. Why some people can go so winning all day? You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding, actually. So, <laughs> so it's, if somebody cannot go so winning uh, the whole marathon, but they came out for the morning session or two hours, hey, that is good. You can say, oh yeah, no blessings for you guys because you didn't, you didn't stay all day or you didn't stay three hours or something, right? So that's how I see this. Learn to cut your losses, right? Because being a perfectionist might cause you not to accomplish your goals. So if David said, you know what, we have to go with 600 because who knows what we're gonna face. You know what, let's wait here. That guy that they met would have died. He hadn't eaten for three days or drank water for three days. He would have died and he was sick. So, because he's waiting, because he's afraid. He can't go with only 400. He must go with his whole army. Cut your losses. Stay here. I'll go with the 400. That's what David did. You have to make decisions right there at the spot. And don't be afraid. Faith. David had faith. And, and, and he loved those people. And he told them to stay. So, David's faith was tested. And he passed with flying colors. Because his hope also was on the promise of God. I will pursue, I will overtake, and I will recover all. So you must not have the best spouse to have a blessed marriage. You know why my marriage is not good? Because my spouse, you know, this person's wife is better than my wife. This person's husband is better than my husband. That's why my marriage is not good. No! What you have is enough. You know, you must not have the best of anything to have for God to bless it. Right? What you have is enough. The 400 that you have is enough. If 300 retired, the 300 is enough. God will still, his promises will still be kept. So what are his, what promises are you holding on to? All right, let's keep moving. Verse 11. They found an Egyptian in the field, sorry, and they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of, uh, a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread or drunk water three days and three nights. So, uh, in uh, this, as, you, as I just read it, I'm like, see, they were running, they were making haste, they couldn't even wait for their own men, but they found an Egyptian in the field, and the men brought, that means it tells me that they were scattered, looking. It's not like all of them were all together, right? If not, if they're all following David, they were running, they're all following David. David would have found the man, <laughs> right? But they're all scattered. Let's just keep searching. Where did these people go? Following tracks. All of, you know, people were trackers, right? You know, following tracks. Where did, where did the whole army go, right? So they found some Egyptian in the field, and those men said, oh, let's bring this guy to David. So they brought the guy to David, and they're like, all right, we don't know, we don't know where we're going. We're not sure. We've gone so far past the brook Besor. We've still been going. We don't know where these guys are. Did they go to Edom? Did they go to Egypt? Like, who knows? So they waited. They were patient. But anyway, first off, be kind to strangers. They found a guy in the field. They were like, let's get this guy, this Egyptian. This is not the guy we're looking for. Let's just continue what, what, what we're searching. But no, they found the guy. They brought the guy to David. What they do? They fed the guy. They revived his spirit where he had to eat him. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, too, be, no, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. What is an angel? It doesn't mean he has a secular thing on his head, a halo and wings. Then, oh yes, come and eat, angel. No, an angel is somebody that's sent from God. <laughs> that's all. Sent from God. So this guy was God sent to them. And if they didn't entertain this guy, who knows? Who knows what would have happened, right? I know God's word will come to pass because he knew that they would. But I'm telling you, if you don't, then God will not give that promise that, hey, you, you recover all. You find, you pursue, overtake, and recover all. So be ready, have that hospitality, uh, uh, spirit of hospitality to entertain strangers, to help them, to take care of them. And he took, they took their time. They were not too busy to entertain the stranger. Oh, I have this mission. I'm too busy. I cannot entertain this guy. No. They waited for him to revive, and it shows that they were going by faith and still staying right by the Lord. All right, verse 13. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, 
I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, and upon the coast which belonged to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me, nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Open to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23, verse 15. So, lesson, be kind to your servants. Whether it's your slaves, your, anybody that is under you, be kind to them. Especially when the person has no options. You know, in, in, for example, in this country, maybe illegal immigrants, they might, you say, oh, when will I have slaves or somebody under me without options? Maybe there's an illegal Im immigrant. I know we don't have that problem here so much but, <laughs> because we don't live by the coast. But if you are, like, if, if it happens and the person has no option, the person like, you know, doesn't, know what, doesn't have papers, nothing like that, then you kind of like mistreat them and be unkind to them and all of that, then God will not bless you. That is not good. And that will come back to haunt you. So be kind to them. The Amalekites were nonchalant about this slave. This slave was sick, and they decided to abandon him. No food, no water. He was sick. It's not like he ran away or something, right? He was there serving them, but he fell sick. And the master said, oh, you're sick. I already got all these new slaves, <laughs> right? We just captured all these new slaves, so I don't care about this guy. So don't be like that and just abandon somebody or, you know, because... You know, they have no option. The guy was just going to lie there and die. Three days, uh, uh, th uh, three nights, no food, no water. He was going to die. And, uh, uh, but David got him and he was revived. So because of that, it cost the Amalekites everything. Everything. They just abandoned one slave. And it lost all the things, their spoils, and their lives. Most of them anyway. You're then Deuteronomy 23, 15. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master, thou, sorry, let me read that again. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant, which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose, in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. So if you were born in the land of Dan, you're a Danite, right? So you're one of the tribes of Dan. Next thing, an immigrant comes and is like, you know what? I want to stay in Judah. They're like, whoa! <laughs> I thought I want to go to Judah. No, no, no. But you were born in Dan. You have to just stay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maybe you can go and live in, in Judah, but your tribe, you know, your land is Dan. But this uh, guy, anybody, any slave that runs away and runs to Egypt for refuge, he can stay anywhere he wants. And the be place that likes him best, and you're supposed to treat him well, not to oppress him. That is the law of God. So there were people, it shows that people were running to Israel for refuge. And they became Israelites or they became Jews. Look at verse 16. Let's move on. So David understood that. And that's why, you know, obviously David is not going to, you know, re report him to his master or return him to his master. Verse 16. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. So what is the Bible saying? They were in no shape to fight. These guys were eating, drunk, scattered all around, no armor, their weapons somewhere else, slaves tied up, you know, animals tied up, just drinking, all of that. And David, verse 17, and David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. So run down your problems and face them head on. Don't run away from your problems. Because you might think, oh, but these problems, I cannot face them. I cannot do anything. I'm powerless to them. I don't know where to start. Just face your problems head on and they will fall before you like a house of cards. Because who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If God be for us, who can be against us? Always remember that, that you're more than conquerors, no matter what it is. So I'm not saying it's going to be very easy, right? It's not going to be easy. Did David fight for two minutes or two hours? No, he fought for over 24 hours. From twilight, that is the sun is setting. It could be morning, but in this context, and usually in the Bible, twilight is night. So from twilight, as the sun is setting, so there's still some sunlight. Till the even of the next day. Even means the sun has set. Over 24 hours of fighting. <laughs> 
and he recovered all. So it wasn't easy. I'm not saying it was easy, but I'm saying you can do it. You know, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Right? It's not by might, it's not by powers, but by the Spirit of God. And God is there to strengthen you, to help you. But you, you have to face that enemy. You have to run that enemy down. You have to face th those challenges. So some, you know, you know, fled. Some of the young men fled. Because when you're facing the devil, you know, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what the Bible says. Right? The devil fights you with wiles and tricks like the Amalekites. They cannot come and fight, fight you head on because, you know, God is with you. So when you make a mistake, you're outside the will of God. Now, you know, that's when you can be attacked and things like that, unless it's a Job situation. But you can be attacked. But um, so he takes your stuff. But when you face him, right, with God, because it's greater is he that is in me, that is in you, than he that is in the world. So when you face the devil, he will flee from you. That's what happens. So all his wiles, everything will just be destroyed. All right, let's move on. Verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. So God is trying to be clear that he kept his word, his promise, right, to David. And God's word was kept. Now, uh, you say, but didn't they spend the things that David uh, the, the, the spoils that they took from Ziglag, did they spend it? The Bible says no. They didn't spend anything of Ziglag. I believe that David recovered all, everything that they took from Ziglag, David recovered. So what were they enjoying and drinking? Remember they raided other cities of the Philistines and the coast of Judah? So it just happens that the things of Ziglag were not touched. It was other things that were touched. Although they burned down Ziglag and the smitten the land Ziglag, but um, they, they, they didn't touch on all those things. They didn't spend anything of their food. I don't know what else they took. But David recovered everything of Ziglag. Then David had spoils on top of it. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. So it's not just that he recovered his own stuff. If you recover your own stuff, it's not called spoil. When they, when they give you back taxes, it's not extra money, folks. You worked hard for it. <laughs> your taxes are extra money. It's not spoiled. So that is your money. In fact, if you had done your accounting right, you get zero dollars back, and that's perfect. So uh, anyway, you get my point. So but this time, David had spoiled, so it means he got more than he had. Than, than they took of Ziglag. So he had all the things of the Philistines and the, the coast of Judah that he took. And that is important to note because it's called, this is David's spoil. David's spoil. Note that. You see, that I will express that in verse 23. All right, verse 21. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide by the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, because they were not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Wow. So there were wicked men and reprobates. When it says sons of Belial, or children of Belial, they are reprobates. Belial is the, the devil. So the child of the devil, like when Jesus was telling the Pharisees that your children of your father, the devil, that is speaking specifically to those Pharisees. It's not just all of, Jew, of, of the Jews, but those Pharisees. So they cannot be saved. They are children of the devil. So that's what it means by reprobate, rejected of the Lord. Anyway, so, and this is the Holy Spirit speaking. It's not just, oh yeah, somebody called them Bil, uh, son of Belial. So there were reprobates and wicked people, whether it's one and the same or some were reprobate, some were wicked people only. So uh, we're up among godly people, among uh, David's men. So, and you know, everyone knew that David served the Lord. So, the, and that tells us that there will be false prophets amongst us. You should always be careful. They, they reprobate wicked people like appearing as children of light and all of that to deceive, but they will eventually make themselves known as they made themselves known. So David knew that they were wrong, but how did David handle it? It's not by calling them names, right? That's not how he handled it. Because it's not like the Holy Spirit told, told him, oh yeah, these ones are reprobates, keep them out. That's not what happened. He 
the Holy Spirit just telling us that the reprobate said this, the wicked people said this. So how is he handling it? Is by making righteous judgments. Judge. God wants us to judge. That's why it says there's no judgment in the land. There's no mercy in the land, right? So judge. In every position that you're in, you should judge. Righteous judgment. And there's a time to judge, who to judge, things like that. So, but God wants us to judge. Verse 23. Then said David, because remember, this is David's spoil. It's not even their spoil. Then said David, ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord had given us, who had preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. You see how men of God call everyone in Israel brethren? Because they are brethren. That's, you know, the place of God. It's just like, if, I mean, if this church is just like full of a thousand people, maybe one or more might be reprobates. But am I going to say, oh, I'm only talking to the saved people here. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I'm going to talk to the whole church. And I'll call everybody brethren, and I love you all. Then when I find out someone's a reprobate, I never loved you. You see what I mean? So that's, it's called, they're all called brethren. Uh, where, where was I? So uh, verse 23 again. Then said David, ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord had given us, who had preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. What do you have that you did not receive? Right? And if you have received it, then why are you boasting? Saying, oh, it's by my power. You guys were weak. You know? So we all received everything that we have, even the spoil. Verse 24. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? I like that. He said, okay, I'm speaking for the righteous men. And I know there are other righteous men in this place. Who is going to hack in unto you with this matter? matter, right? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And this is like soul winning again. There's division of labor, right? There are some people that cannot go soul winning. Maybe they are nine months pregnant. Why well, there are some people that can't go soul winning. So, now, if you're deceiving and you deceive us and you, know, you cannot go, you do as if you cannot go so winning, and while you can, then you're deceiving yourself, right? It's, you're affecting your own self. But if you cannot, or you're a silent partner or something, hey, you're still getting the rewards. Everything is shared as if you did the work also. Because we need, see, if my wife is not there to take care of the kids and little ones and all of that, I'm not going to go so winning. It's as simple as that. <laughs> I'm not going to go. I'm going to take care of my kids. That's what's going to happen. I would rather raise soul winners than lose my kids. So your family is the most important ministry you have. So your wife helping you or you know, people helping or doing things in the church or uh, uh, facilit uh, fac facilitating soul winning, they get the rewards also. Amen? Amen? Verse 25, and it was so from that day forward that that he made it a statue and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Open to Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14, verse 16. Proverbs 14, verse 16. And this is where I see a display of charity. Charity. Helping everybody, every, uh, give, sharing equally with everybody. So you saw the display of faith. You saw the display of hope. Uh, and all of them in different varying degrees. And now, perfect display of charity with his own men. So a good leader will always shun evil. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse 16, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. The simple, so it's not like David was even angry with those guys, right? No, or not, he wasn't just provoked and angry with them. He's like making the right decision. He says, my brethren, Right? Come on, think about it. Who's going to stand you with you in this matter? So don't you you would deal foolishly if you're soon angry, if you're overcome by your 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 yourself, your emotions. So David, as you know, encourages himself in the Lord. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Who will stand with you in this matter? Because evil bows before good. When you present the good, present the evil, the men are like, oh yeah. <laughs> they all bow. Everybody kept their mouth shut and it became an ordinance, a statue in Israel. David made that. So the poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich had many friends. Look at verse 21, it goes with it. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that had mercy on the poor, happy is he. Oh, these poor people, they couldn't go with us. That means they have no spoils. No, don't despise the poor. 
help the poor because it's a sin if you despise them. Right? So David is remembering all these things. Or oh, not remembering, but he knows all these All these things are from the laws of God, by the way. These are just wisdom nuggets or wisdom um, points taken from the laws of God. It's not like, oh yeah, this is different. If you read the laws of God and you understand them, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. I'm talking about the first five books. You can get all this wisdom nugget. That's where Solomon got it from. It wasn't like making up new stuff. Verse 22, and the last, Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. So they are devising evil. Oh, yeah, you guys did not go with us. So, you know, you'll be harmed. You know, we will take all the stuff. So they err. That is a mistake. All right. So those wicked men may easily have persuaded the simple, but not the prudent, not the wise. The wise, because the simple, they can, uh, greed can easily come, they can be taken over by greed. Their flesh can be motivated and taken. They be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. We're the ones that fought the battle. Yeah, we should take this stuff. We'll give you guys your, wait, don't, are you not happy that you have your wife and your kids? Before you didn't have your wife and your kids and you were crying. Now you have your wife and your kids, you're not satisfied. See, you're not content. See, that's what the simple will start thinking. But the wise is like, no. They stayed by this stuff. It's not their fault. Hey, let's all share everything equally. It's God that gave us all these things. What do we have? So that's what the wise thinks about because the prudent, they have mercy on the poor and they'll be rewarded. So um, David's principle is from God's commandment, even on soldiers. Remember, if you're going to fight Israel, if you're afraid, don't go and fight. If you just got married a year or so, don't go and fight. Right? Stay back, cherish your wife and all of that. But, uh, but, it doesn't, but they get the blessings of the, of the victory, right? They get the safety, they get the land, all of that. So from that law of God, David derives this principle that everybody shares the spoils. So continue to do good. Don't say, oh, I've been the one doing the soul winning. I've been the one doing the work in church. I've been the one doing this. I've been the one doing that. And you're wearing doing good, then you will not reap in due season. So just continue to do good. God will repay you in his time. All right, verse 26. Let's finish up. I'll read to the end here. And when David came to Ziglag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which are in Bethel, to them which were in the south, Ramoth, to them which were in Jatiah, to them which were in Aroya, to them which were in Sifomoth, Sif, 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 to them which were in Eshtimoa, to them which were in Rekal, to them which were in the cities, cities of the Jeramelites, Jeramelite, and to them which were in the cities of the Kenites, and to them which were in Homer, to them which were in Koroshan, Koroshan to them which were in Athak, to them which were to them which were in Hebron, to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. To haunt, haunt there means to visit frequently and where they stayed as fugitives. They went there and they lived by there. So all those places, David gave spoils, right? This is another act of charity. Remember, the cities of Judah were raided. The cities of Judah were raided. So David did not just take all that stuff and say, oh yeah, I'm the one that fought for it. So it's not just his men that he shared it with. He gave back to the cities of Judah. That I'm sure it's not all the cities that he gave raided. I mean, it's just he went even in, in town. But he gave back to the cities of Judah. He gave back to his friends. Notice he didn't mention that city, uh, that city that always told Saul about him. I can't remember the name. <laughs> but that city is not mentioned. But he gave back to his friends, a place that he always stayed, and they blessed him, and they gave him food, and they gave him shelter. That's who David uh, gave back. So where he, was, where he was hiding and they supported him, he, they got repaid. So when you're helping the people of God, you're helping the man of God, you're helping the church, you're, God is going to pay you back. Out of nowhere, they just got spoils and, and blessings. So these people that kept David and helped David and his men, David could have continued to be there uh, rather than go into Gath. But everything worked out and they got all these charities or all these blessings from David. So it's more displays of charity. And this is not about David bribing them. Because you might think, oh yeah, David was bribing them for the kingdom. No, David went back to, where did he go back to? Uh, to Ziglag. He actually went back to Ziglag. He stayed there for a, a few days. If you read in Second Samuel, we're going to get to it if in the future, God willing. 
He went back to Ziglag, and that's where he heard that Israel was defeated, and Saul was dead. He was in Ziglag. Then he asked God, should I go to Judah? And God said, you know, go, go to Hebron. Anyway, so that's how, if not, you have given everything to Hebron, you know, to bribe them. No, but he was just sharing it around. He was sharing the law. So that is charity you see here. So finally, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the Bible says, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So um, learn to have varying degrees of this, but know that charity is the greatest of all these three, faith, hope, and charity. Let's bow our heads.